Well, welcome again. My thanks again to uh, Amanda and Terry, all of our music folks, and everyone making worship possible this morning. And it's great to see all of you in God's house. We continue our series in the Gospel of Luke in the footsteps of Jesus. And this morning we're looking at the story of the prodigal, also known as the greatest story. We're in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the figs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because your brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts and minds this morning. Well, I don't know how many of you watched the Kentucky Derby yesterday. Any any Derby fans out there? And uh, did you get a lump in your throat when they did my old Kentucky home? Oh my gosh, isn't that beautiful? I'm not from Kentucky. I do love the scenery down there, but to see all those people, some weepy eyed singing that. And for those of you who like those precious music moments. In just a few Sundays from now, we have the Indianapolis 500 when they will sing back home again in Indiana. And if you're from Alabama or just a rock fan, they're sweet home Alabama. (laughs) All of them are homecoming songs. And don't you like a homecoming? Well, I invite you to think about homecomings as we look at this story of Jesus as we continue in our series in the footsteps of Jesus and we look at the story of the prodigal also known as the greatest story ever told man it is a powerful and beautiful story it has inspired some of the greatest artwork uh, literature and art of all time so uh, some of them are pictured up here on the screen and uh, they include Caravaggio, Michelangelo, Da Vinci And, of course, Rembrandt's uh, The Prodigal Comes Home. So beautiful, beautiful stories. There's lots of them. And, of course, there's been books and movies, all kinds of things that have been inspired by this powerful story known as the greatest story ever told. And so I invite you to walk back into this story this morning. But I also want you to think about something that was very interesting, that there was a survey that was done asking Americans what the three favorite sayings were. You know, all these favorite sayings. And the three most popular sayings, do you know what they were? Well, it's easy to guess the first one. I love you. Second one was I forgive you. And third one, supper's ready. (laughs) 
I love you, I forgive you, and supper's ready. Well, here's the interesting thing. All three of those phrases can be seen in this story, the greatest story. And so I invite you back into that story this morning. And the first is, I love you. I love you. And in this story, Jesus tells the story of this man who had an estate. Uh, think of a farm, uh, Indiana farm maybe, where it's in a family inheritance. And it's been in a family for, for years, for generations. Uh, the man has two sons, an older son and a younger son. And the younger son comes to him one day and asks for his share of the inheritance. Now, at that time, it's probably quite likely that the the father may have even had to sell off a piece of that property. So you can imagine, you know, that this is something that's been in the family for generations, sell off a piece of that. But the father does it. He sells that property. He does whatever he can to raise that money and gives his younger son his share of the inheritance. And he goes off, we're told, into a distant land. Rebellious youth. Boy, you've seen that a lot before, haven't you? Maybe you've been in a phase like that in your own life, or maybe now you're in a phase like that. And I wonder what it is that the father said to the son when he was walking away. The story doesn't record it, but I think I know. I think he said, I love you. I love you. I love you. Which says so much, doesn't it? You're my son. You're always welcome home. I love you. And you know, as parents, you say that. That's the first thing I say to my daughter every morning. She's still asleep a lot of times. I just kiss her on the forehead and say, I love you. And the last thing I say to her every night, I love you. And it's not always easy. Sometimes we're in a context where, you know, particularly men, we don't want to say, I love you, maybe or something, or share our emotions. But we need to. We need to say, I love you. You can just say, you know, assume someone knows that. It's so important to carry that message with you wherever, wherever you go. Sometimes we need to find a new way to say it, right? For me, I guess it was about 10 years ago, a little bit more than that, I guess it was, and um, my daughter got her first cell phone. <laughs> and she took her to it naturally. <laughs> oh man, it was like she was a 16 year old and she wasn't even a teenager and she was on it. She'd always had this plastic cell phone that she pretended to talk on it, and she did it so well and everything, but she was so overjoyed again. But she was, you know, doing all this texting all the time, right? And you know, so I'm looking and said, what, what are you texting? And, and she said, dad, emojis. Emojis, this was a while ago. I said, what's that? Oh, dad, you know, got the yellow heart and the red heart, you got the broken heart, got all these sunshine, all this stuff. So I'm you know, like, well, you know, I thought to myself, well, I mean, I send her text, but as I was thinking, I wasn't, never did an emoji before, right? I never sent a text that was emoji, but I thought to myself, you know, someday there's going to be some boy sending her emojis. <laughs> she needs to know that dad can emoji too, right? <laughs> So, <laughs> I can speak emoji, so I learn emoji. I send her yellow hearts and red hearts and all those I love you things, and now I love doing it, right? I do it all the time. I do it every single day. Sometimes you have to learn a new language to convey that you love the person, you care about the person. I love you. And then that son, younger son, went with his inheritance, probably that top of the world, goes to a distant land, and he buys all kinds of friends, right? You know how that is? Parties and women, friends, everything. He's just going crazy, eating and drinking and partying, and all of a sudden his money runs out. At the same time his money runs out, there's a severe famine. Don't you know when things happen? More things happen. And all of a sudden his friends are gone. The parties are gone. And he looks around with nothing. And the only job he can find during this famine is to go and feed pigs. And it's horrible for any of us, but at that time, for a young Jewish man, to be with pigs was forbidden. So he's the lowest estate possible. And he's so hungry that he's jealous of the stuff that he's feeding pigs. Corn husk and flop and leftovers. Oh, how life had changed for him. But maybe echoing in the back of his mind were the words of his father and the heart of the father, I love you. I love you. And he 
devises a plan where he says, I'm, I'm not going to go back as a son. I never deserved to be a son after what I've done. I've squandered an inheritance of my family. I've lived like a fool. I've been rebellious. I'm going to go back as a servant, not as a son. I don't deserve to be a son. I'll just ask to be a servant because the servants in my father's house are so much better off that I am here feeding pigs in a distant land. And so he's rehearsing this as he's walking back to his father. And his father sees him a long ways off, probably been in the same spot looking for his son day after day after day, month after month maybe. And he sees his son. He runs to his son and embraces him. And the son begins his speech that he's rehearsed in his mind, saying, Father, I no longer deserve to be your son. I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you, my father. Just welcome me back as a servant. What does his father say, basically? The second thing, I forgive you. I forgive you. You're welcome back, not as a servant, but as a, as a son. I've known You've done all kinds of wrong things in a distant land. I know you've squandered your inheritance and you have nothing, but I forgive you. You're my son. And in that beautiful moment, his father embraces him, I'm sure both had tears in their eyes. And the father shouts for the servants all the help to bring a, a new robe for his son, and puts a, a new robe and throws away the tattered robe and says, puts a ring on his finger because he's probably hawked the family ring that he had to show that he was a son. And then the father says, bring new sandals for his feet and then throw a celebration like we've never had before because my son who was lost is, is now found. And when you think about it, what do those things mean that the father gave the son? In addition to his arms of welcome and love and forgiveness. What does the robe mean? You notice the father didn't say wash the robe, but he had. The father said get him a new robe. The robe is a symbol of new life. Not just cleaning up the old, a whole new life like we have in Christ. And the ring, of course, is a symbol of sonship wasn't a servant, he was a son, and being welcomed back as a son, despite all that he'd done. What are the sandals, new sandals, symbols of? Freedom. Freedom. Because just like the father knew that when he had to let his son go, he knew that you can't force love, you can't force relationship, and so he had to let the son go. And so he was, had to be free in order to have a relationship of love. But the father knew deep in his heart that the son would never leave again because of love and forgiveness. And then, of course, let's have a celebration. Kill a fatted calf, do everything you can, let's have a party. And that's, that's something to think about, isn't it? It reminds me of the story, the true story of Alice Cooper, I don't know, so you got to go back to some of you rock fans out there, Alice Cooper. And Alice Cooper, when I was growing up, that was like, you know, the musical act to see, you know, this rebellious, a guy had like three drum sets, three separate drummers. <laughs> you know, how they ever drum, I have no idea. And uh, loud music, antics on the stage, all kinds of stuff. And just wild and crazy concerts, known for all kinds of things on the concert stage. And then at one point, I heard that Alice Cooper got saved. He gave his life to Christ. And I thought to myself, well, that's just an act. <laughs> He's just looking for publicity. He's going to renege on all this down the road, but he didn't. And Alice Cooper tells his own story of his life, and you can see the video of it. But he, he talks about that he was a pastor's kid. <laughs> oh, I know what that's like. He's a pastor's kid, and he just had to rebel do all he can to be rebellious. He said, he, and he said in his own words, he said, I was, I was the prodigal. I ran away. I was rebellious, did brightest living. He said, but there's a moment where I wanted to come home, wanted to come back. And I made my step of faith. I gave my life to Christ. He said, the most radical thing that I ever did was to become a Christian. 
The most radical thing I ever did was to become a Christian. And he founded a camp in Arizona for young rebellious rockers <laughs> where they learn music and they learn about faith in kind of a subtle way. I had a radio show for a long time. I used to kind of slip faith in sideways there. It was always powerful, but he always had great things to say. And then he had an auction of classic cars once a year to help with all those causes to help young people that are wayward. And so it's so powerful as the prodigal comes home. I love you, I forgive you, and finally, supper's ready. <laughs> I love this scene, a celebration. Kill the fatted calf. Let's have a celebration, a great homecoming for all you homecoming fans, not just in the fall or, you know, kind of the homecoming songs of the Kentucky Derby and the Indianapolis 500. You take your pick, whatever they are, your favorite alma mater, all mixed in with a homecoming. Who doesn't love a homecoming? Because it's more than just a dinner. It's a celebration supper. It's a homecoming. Wow, and it's so, so powerful because it isn't just love and forgiveness. It's we celebrate that you were lost or found. We celebrate that you're part of the family. We celebrate that you were broken and are whole again. And I love the true story of John Newton, who was a young man growing up. And just as a young boy, his mother died and he so loved his mother his father did not take the loss of his wife very well and this boy's mother and so his father became very abusive a drinking problem he was a navigator for a ship and his son rebelled as anyone might be and so he couldn't handle the son he sent him off to military school where he learned navigation but he rebelled at military school and he fled there ran away found himself on the west coast of africa and there a slave ship picked him up found out he was a navigator, became navigator for a slave ship, and he writes about kind of the horrors of that, and he was a great navigator, but he was a horrible sailor. <laughs> he got drunk, incited the crew to rebellion, and at one point the captain was so furious at him at sea that he threw him overboard, and then he realized he needed a navigator, so he harpooned him and dragged him back on the ship. He was wounded, threw him in the hull of the ship in the brig, and there this young man looked up through the open floorboards of the boat deck and at night looked at the stars and said, oh, if there's the God of my mother, the way she prayed, forgive me and make my life new. And he records that his life was changed dramatically in that moment. So changed that he ended up going back to his hometown, married a childhood sweetheart, became pastor of a church, wrote hundreds of hymns, one of which is Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wrench like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The prodigal come home, the lost found, the son welcomed home. I love you, I forgive you, supper's ready. But that's not all. The story doesn't end there. It ends with this dramatic scene of the elder brother. And there's the elder brother, he hears all the music, the dancing, because the father had to have a band for all this, you know. <laughs> and he asked one of the servants what was going on. The servant told him, your brother's come home. We're throwing a party for him. Your father is going all out for this party. And instead of being happy and welcoming, the older brother's angry and jealous. And he doesn't go into the party. And so the father comes out to him and says, what's wrong, son? He said, all these years, all these years I worked for you, slaved for you, and you never once threw me a party. And the father says, no, son, all I've ever had is yours. You could always invite your friends over for a party. But your younger brother who is lost is now found, and we must celebrate. And the story ends there dramatically, dramatically, with the father pleading with the older son. And so if you've been following the last few weeks as we've gone through these three stories that Jesus is telling, Jesus is telling this story in the context where the religious leaders have come to Jesus upset. But Jesus is with sinners and tax collectors, those who need heal, the outcast, the least lonely, the lost and forgotten, and they're upset at Jesus. 
And Jesus has told these three stories. The first, the good shepherd and the lost sheep, or the shepherd has a hundred sheep. One is lost and the shepherd looks high and low until he's found the lost sheep and then he brings that sheep home and there's rejoicing. And then the story of the woman with the lost coin he has 10 coins and she loses one and she sweeps the house and lights a lamp and looks until she's found it and then she calls her friends and rejoices and then this story and Jesus has sort of set those stories up with a certain expectation of rejoicing and here at the end of this story the greatest story there's no rejoicing with the older son and why is that well, in many respects, he represents these religious leaders and some of us sometimes who stayed in the house and knew all the rules and checked all the rules off but never had a relationship in the heart. And when we see someone come in from the outside and be welcomed and forgiven and loved, the least, the lonely, the marginalized, the outsiders, the forgotten, we find ourselves jealous on the inside. How can they be given the same place as us? But you see, God's love is that expansive. God loves the older brother just like God loves the younger brother. God loves all of us. But God is saying in order to be the son of the father, you need to have the heart of the father. And it isn't just about rules, it's about relationship to be a son because even though the son was in the house and never ran away he was really a long ways from who the father really was at his heart and so the father is pleading with the son not only to come and to celebrate the brother being found but also to have a relationship with him and that's what God would say to all of us I think that God is there for us, whether we're the prodigal, runaway, rebellious, wasted money, living large with our inheritance until it all runs out and comes crashing down on us. We have no friends. We have no home. We have to come home begging, we think, for a relationship, only to find the Father embracing us, not as a servant, but as a son or as a daughter, with a new robe a new life a ring of sonship and a sandals of freedom for relationship and a celebration like no other or we're the older brother or older sister following all the rules going through the motions but not really with the heart of the father god wants you there close to his heart god wants us to celebrate and so this, the greatest story, is something for all of us, wherever you see yourself in this story this morning. Truth be told, many of us find ourselves in different places in the story, at different stations of life, different places along the road. But what I can tell you is that the heart of God's word, and even more importantly, at the heart of God's heart are those three phrases that are in the story. I love you. I forgive you, supper's ready. I love you, I forgive you, supper's ready. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who whoever believes him would not perish but have eternal life. And Paul, Paul, who is an older brother at one point in his life, wasn't he? <laughs> Going through the rules, writes this to the Romans about God's love because Paul as the older brother had discovered God's love he said no in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord a word from the older brother who found the loving arms of the father and there's something else. As we gather around the Lord's table today and every time, those are the three phrases you should hear around the Lord's table. I love you. I forgive you. Supper's ready. And every time in God's house, I love you. 
I forgive you. Supper's ready. So today, as a family of faith, I invite us in, whether you feel like you're the younger or the older, the lost looking, the found celebrating, the older looking on, you are welcome in God's house. You're welcome at God's table. You're welcome because God loves you and paid the price for all of our sins and shortcomings through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I love you. I forgive you. Supper's ready. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word and your heart of love. For you are the Father who loves all of us, and you come looking for us. So, Lord, thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for the way that you provide the pathway to you through the cross of Jesus Christ. Help us all, help us all, Lord, to find your heart of love and your relationship, and help us all to welcome all those who welcome in your house. We pray in Christ's name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.